Please give a warm welcome to Sean Sheehy. <laughs> I love to uh, talk about what I make. And, um, and it's funny to hear Owen say, you know, um, Sean's here to talk about the magic of making a pop-up book. Um, but, you know, it's like, uh, you know, ask a magician how he does magic. And, you know, the answer is, magician never tells their secrets. And so, um, sometimes this presentation can be a little uh, frustrating, I think, because it's like, here's how I do things. And it's kind of technical and it's kind of creative and there's things happening over here and over here. Um, and a lot of it is just very cerebral and it's not very visual. And um, even though I'm a fairly verbal guy, sometimes it's hard to articulate. And so I'll get to the end of a pre presentation and then someone will ask the question, okay, that's great, but how do you do that? How do you do that? And I'll say, I, I, I don't know, it just happens. It just happens. <clears throat> so, um, which is not meant to say that uh, you aren't all welcome to ask uh, all, all great questions at the end. So, quick word on um, uh, how things got started. Um, you know, because people say, you know, it's, it's, it's weird, because there's no academic training, really, for, for making pop-up books. There's no um, uh, post-secondary institute that teaches paper engineering. So, so most of us are autodidactic. We all teach ourselves. And um, you know, I don't know when it was 10 years ago. Who knows? And someone said, so really, Sean, you know, how'd you get started? And I thought, well, my dad makes furniture, um, you know, casually. But there's a wood shop attached to the house, and he makes furniture. And um, my mom makes clothes, again, not professionally, casually. But she's got her whole place in the basement where she makes clothes. I'm like, oh yeah, I, I grew up with people that make dimensional things using patterns. Okay, this makes sense, this makes sense. Um, I have an education degree, and so um, you know, I spend a lot of time thinking about using books uh, in teaching and learning. And so you know, having this whole category of books that we refer to as concept books that are teaching ideas, colors, letters, animals, shapes, et cetera, uh, books that aren't really necessarily set up with a narrative structure to them. It's just, here's this set of things that we're going to talk about. Uh, certainly play a strong role in how I think about putting a book together. And it's a nice way to think about taking a reader through a book when you don't necessarily have a narrative that you're leaning on. Uh, my folks are the kind of people that kept bird books in the windows and binoculars in the windows. And you know, so we're looking outside at things <coughs> all the time when I was a kid. I spent three years uh, as a camp counselor, so um, I, uh, three years, four summers, three years. And uh, so I spent a lot of times out in the woods helping young people understand the world around them, and that really sort of internalized a lot of ideas for me too. And then finally, you know, there's a couple of major engineers, Matthew Reinhardt and Robert Sabuda being two of them, who collaborated on this T-Rex. And they, in the 90s, the late 90s, early 2000s, kind of um, ushered in a renaissance in pop-ups in um, the US. And the big thing that they brought to it was a sense of animation in actuation. So that not only does the dinosaur pop up, but when the dinosaur pops up, it reaches out and takes a bite out of you. It's dramatic and fun. <clears throat> So visually, you know, a couple of, a couple of big folks that I'm interested in, Lois Ellert and Charlie Harper being two of them, um, you know, very popular. Um, but the idea of thinking graphically uh, and flat color shapes uh, is really, um, really a big part of how I work too. So the, so the first, book, first book I ever made was this one called Counting on the Marsh, counting book, it's another concept book. And it was something that um, basically came together when I was in design school. And I was essentially just needing to solve a design problem and I decided to make a pop-up book to do it. And I lived in um, uh, an area where there was a marsh and there was some discussion about needing to sort of manage the marsh population. Uh, and so this book was kind of an answer to that. 
and thinking about all of the different creatures that are in a system that are part of a system and being a human and trying to think about what is our responsibility, our agency in managing a system. So I made this, Counting on Martian, Nighttime Book of Numbers, and <coughs> it's all uh, rendered in these prints that pop up on um, these fairly translucent, translucent sheets of paper. Um, uh, and, and this book, I executed this version of it in grad school, um, which was a book and paper arts MFA at Columbia College in Chicago. And so um, I made all of the paper for this book. I did the printing, um, did the writing, did the binding. Um, I cast the covers um, out of fiber. Um, uh, I was kind of geeked out on wanting to do everything in this book production. And on each page, there is residue of the creatures that feature in the illustration. So in this case, I used a clear coat for snail slime. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> so we see, we see the creatures as they move through, um, through 10 pages, um, ending with our herons here. So we had that kind of sunsetty image first, and now we've got this nighttime image. Uh, with the herons here at the end, and it's sleepy time, and it's time to go to sleep. Uh, next project was uh, Welcome to the Neighborhood. Um, <laughs> and uh, this existed uh, as an artist book first. Ultimately, it got picked up by Candlewick and became a trade book as well. But this is the artist book version that you're seeing here. And in getting it together to think about this project, I wanted to um, do something kind of meta about building. I was interested in thinking about building um, and then thinking about animals and then thinking about how animals build. And then I thought it'd be fun to like build the things that animals build as a pop-up. Um, and so that's what got this book going. And ultimately then, <coughs> excuse me, it also became a little bit of a, of an examination of the codependencies, the co-relationships of creatures um, throughout the system. Uh, and then also, you know, it's absolutely targeted uh, towards younger audiences, though I don't care who looks in my pop-up books, anyone is welcome. Um, it, it's, it's written in verse, not terribly uh, uh, gracefully, um, but each of the pages ends with an ellipses, and the word that uh, doesn't show up there that would complete the rhyme is the name of the creature that's on the following page. So it kind of is another way to grab a reader and carry him through the, um, the book without necessarily giving them a narrative rope to hang on to. You're gonna notice that my books are collections of animals and plants, period. That's what I do. Um, but you know, within that, I aim for you know, different kinds of subtexts and then uh, different communities of animals and trying to think about it fairly, uh, in a fairly diverse way. So in the case of this one, uh, I needed to have a, a fish because you know, that makes for a diverse set of animals. And the only North American fish that builds a structure um, is the stickleback. And the stickleback, there's a couple different uh, varieties of stickleback. And it's the freshwater one in specifically that we're talking about here. And they only exist in lakes around um, Minnesota, which meant that this book was set in Minnesota. Um, and when Candaway picked it up, they said, ah, lose the Minnesota thing. It's just, it can be bigger. So I, you know, I, I like to think sculpturally when I'm working. And it's the, it's the shape of things that come first and the mechanics that kind of happen second. And in the honeybee spread, it felt important to have a honeycomb looking like a honeycomb. And um, it was kind of a moment of pride because uh, I wanted the honeycomb to be fully formed. But then it required some, you know, some engineering thinking that would allow those combs to sort of uh, 
uh, hold together, but then also collapse. Um, and so basically there's these little slides that exist on the sides that allow for the compression and expansion and remaining fluid. Uh, so it was a moment of engineering pride for that structure right there. And so here's the, that version that you just saw. Um, and this is the slide that is cueing me to tell you the story of the lovely people at Kendallwick who said, we like this book. We like the concept of this book. We want you to do this. We want you to do this just like this. Um, and here are the things that we need to change. <laughs> Which, you know, is, is understandable and it's fine. Um, and one of, the things, one of the things that they really like about the original is that it's all made out of handmade paper. And so the surfaces are really lush. Um, the colors are really saturated. And um, they, for their version, literally had me build all of the artwork in handmade paper. And then they shot the handmade paper and reproduced that to get those same kind of yummy, super toothy surfaces on the sheet. They also invested in, um, uh, in a new scanner for this project to capture that surface detail. And it had uh, internal lighting to it to help bring that out. And when I got the first proofs back and looked at them, um, everything was kind of grayed out. And I was comparing things and I contacted them and I said, this is, great, but it's kind of, you know, 10% grayed out. And what we realized was that the scanner was so sensitive and the sheet was so toothy, it was basically picking up shadows and it was the shadows of the tooth that were graying it out. So, you know, it was an easy Photoshop fix, um, but it was a, a testament to the degree to which the publisher was willing to go to, to recreate the artwork exactly as I had intended it, but with changes. So I jumped into uh, Beyond the Sixth Extinction next, which was um, inspired by having read Richard Leakey's kind of first treatment on this topic. Uh, Elizabeth Colbert, of course, has, um, wrote The Sixth Extinction, and many of you might be familiar with that one. It's a much more recent book. Um, but this idea you know, that we've had six big extinction events over the course of the Earth's history, um, one of which was the asteroid strike that killed the dinosaurs. And so now we're in the sixth one, and it's uh, human authored. And um, you know, this is a pretty provocative idea. And um, I wanted to think about it in a way that would provoke other people to think about it, um, but also to try to find uh, you know, any sort of cautious optimism in the situation. So here are some sketchbook pages. Um, this is me being willing to show my very talented illustration colleagues um, the coarseness of my drafts, drafts, drafting skills. Um, I do kind of like this one. That one's not so bad. Um, Things get real when I get out of the paper. That's, that's the thing. <clears throat> uh, and I wanted to throw in a quick, quick slide, too, in getting into uh, production to talk just a tiny little bit about papermaking. Again, in the transition of this from an artist book, which it originally was, into the trade book that it also became, uh, Candlewick said, we love this, do it exactly like this, blah, 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 you know the story. Um, to the point where they, they saw the color of the first one, which is basically this palette, and, and, you know, and recreate this exactly, exactly, exactly. So you know, if anyone's ever tried to dye to match, um, there was a lot of initial sheet forming in the studio, which is what's happening up here, and starting with an initial color and then coming back home and getting out some vats and getting out some um, fiber reactive dyes um, and doing a lot of color tests and ultimately doing a lot of dipping into vats repeatedly, repeatedly to, to get the colors to match. So back to this idea of the sixth extinction and how to think about it in a way that might put a, put a tolerable spin on it. 
I thought, you know, what's, what's, what's going to survive? If we're going to have an extinction event, what's going to survive? And, you know, it's animals that are going to be, uh, you know, have a certain amount of intelligence, a certain amount of adaptability, um, uh, animals that are pretty comfortable living in human-made environments. And, um, and so I developed a set, again, looking for a certain amount of diversity between species, among species, and then, you know, basically roaches, roaches. Um, that's where things start. Um, I also, though, wanted to think about these creatures in a way that uh, basically turned them into bioremediators. You know, how are, how are the animals that are surviving reacting to the environment and taking what is currently technological waste and restoring it into ecological nutrients and breaking down plastics and breaking down concrete and neutralizing radioactivity and um, uh, neutralizing heavy metals, you know, all these kinds of things. All the animals in this book have those jobs. They are sequenced in this book by order of um, evolution, essentially, because the book's set 3,000 years in the future. So I chose a set of animals that survive and then evolving them forward 3,000 years and devising a couple of ways to make it seem reasonable that 3,000 years is enough time to make some fairly serious differences evolutionarily in these animals. And so the cockroach at the very beginning basically just gets bigger because that's you know, the perfect stuff of every nightmare. Um, <laughs> urban living. Um, and then at the end, uh, I have these mice. Um, and the mice basically become fixed creatures. They mount themselves on walls up out of the reach of predators. Um, and then they adopt a radial body plan. So their limbs have all sort of migrated up around their mouth. And then they're just sort of you know, stuffing food in. <coughs> and then because they're rooted, um, the backside is kind of closed off, if you know what I'm saying. So everything that goes down is basically coming right back up. Um, it's, it's gross. It's a little gross. It's good teenager material. So again, like I said, this got picked up by um, Candlewick and became one of the largest pop-up books uh, in the history. It's, it's, it's giant, um, which was great because there were a lot of creatures in the book that have become essentially life-size to the fiction of the book, um, which is delightful. Um, and then it's just, it's a big giant book and that's really nice. They kept, uh, they kept the, the pop-ups exactly as they are, um, colors exactly as they are. Um, a, few things, a few things had to get swapped out, uh, but for the most part, things just got bigger. Um, and then they brought on the illustrator, Jordi Saldano, um, who introduced some illustration and helped to kind of flesh out the story of this book. It's all kind of um, written uh, as if it were a field guide and that this is essentially a new system that is discovered, uh, which is basically Chicago. And... Um, <laughs> There was, a, there was a nuclear reactor explosion, and uh, uh, lots of species got wiped out because of that, as well as other sort of environmental things. And uh, so this, this researcher stumbled onto life forms in the area, and this is sort of a first pass at what is now living in the area. And there are these text panels on the side that you open, and then it shows that sort of first pass at these field guidey kinds of nuggets of information. Um, and you can read that while you're looking at the pop. And then on the following page, this is where they brought Jordi in. Jordi introduces some different views on the creatures. Um, they had me expand the text exponentially 
because uh, you know originally it was just this. The original artist book is just the field guide nuggets, and then everything kind of got spelled out. So uh, the 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 next three books I did were all part of a, a series essentially, and I launched into making these plant books. Um, they're plant books because I wanted gigs at Botanic Gardens to teach other people how to make pop-up flowers. And I developed a, a study set, and I started doing this, and I thought, well, I've got these. I could make a book out of them, and I could then, you know, another way to generate some income from this intellectual property. So having first had the set of wildflowers, I then followed that up by writing an essay that considered that Victorian idea of the language of, of flowers, where you give someone a flower, it means a specific thing. Um, and in the case of my book, it kind of brings that all into the 21st century. Um, and specifically on the Columbine page, I talk about the Columbine massacre um, and you know, what, we, what we have learned from that. So, uh, you know, it's a little, little somber, um, but not entirely. And then that's just, that's an essay that tacks in at the end of the, at the end of the book. And, you know, flowers are pretty. Flowers are fun. Flowers are very uh, sculptural. They have nice shapes. And, um, and it's fun. It's fun to make pretty shapes. And I thought, enough easy things. What can I do next? that will be more challenging. And I thought, lumpy, lumpy shapes. That's what I want to do next. <clears throat> and, and, I, and, I, and I stepped into this area of, of taking old plant lore and bringing it into now and thinking, okay, we've got these culinary herbals um, that are ancient, you know, um, Pliny in his natural history. He has lots of herbal remedies. Um, things like, um, if your child is weak, you should eat a cabbage. And after you've eaten the cabbage, you should pee on your child. And that will strengthen your child. And I thought, this is good stuff. This is good material. So using those sort of old ideas, um, sometimes ridiculous ideas, um, you know, they talk about sympathetic cures as well, where I have a headache, so I need to eat something that looks like a brain. There's a walnut. Oh. I'll eat that, and my headache will go away. Um, sawbones, sawbones. <clears throat> um, so in my culinary herbal, um, I am feeding people vegetables and talking about the societal ills that can be cured by eating vegetables. And, and in this case, as you can see in the slide there, um, the text for each vegetable is kind of tucked into this little little subfolio on the page. The cauliflower might possibly be my favorite on, uh, in this book. Um, just the idea of abstracted lumps turning into something that's sort of compelling and mechanically interesting. It was, it was fun. It was fun. So I set myself up. I made the first book of flowers, and I printed on the title page that it was part of a series. <laughs> so I was committed. And then I made the second, and I honored that series idea. And uh, I felt like you have to have three for it to count. Mm -hmm. So um, I made three. And here's number three. And I cast widely, wildly, widely, widely for an idea of the next sort of set of lore things to center around plants. And um, the lore of holiday plants um, just stood there in the center of the room and stared at me and threw things at me. Um, and I said, I don't want to make a Christmas book. I don't want to make a Christmas book. I don't want to make a Christmas book. Everyone makes Christmas books. Christmas is the time of the year where we least need more stuff around. I don't want to make a Christmas book. So I made a Christmas book. Um, but what you'll discover is it is the most reductive, minimalist holiday book ever in the history of people. 
And the, the palette is very minimal. I think there's six colors in this book. Um, anytime this word shows up, it shows up like that, because I can cut some letters out um, repeatedly. Um, it shows up in the title, uh, <coughs> kind of leaning on you know, this plant phrase, but also cutting. And then all the text is written in haiku. Um, so it's reduced. Uh, and also, in sort of doing some um, research, I learned that in the Japanese haiku tradition, they refer to the word or punctuation that ends the second line as the cutting, uh, because it's basically a pivot from something that's introduced in the first two lines to whatever's happening in the third line. So I thought, oh, this, this, is, this is good, this is good. So trimming, 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 trimming. Uh, this next is my favorite in the book. I'll just let you live with that for a second. <clears throat> no joke, no joke. They have researched mistletoe. And mistletoe, as you all know, is a parasite. And it grows in the branches of host trees. And mistletoe will not germinate if it is not up in the branches of a tree. If those seeds fall to the ground, they're done. So uh, mistletoe depends on animals to distribute the seeds. And so the mistletoe berries are just super sticky. And they maintain that stickiness as they pass through the digestive tract, whatever consumed it. And then when um, waste products are dropped from whatever animal, um, they're sticky. And they stay up in the branches of wherever so that they'll germinate. So literally, mistletoe is poop on a stick. <laughs> and then here's, here's one more. <clears throat> it, felt, it felt useful to lean on the other hemisphere for, um, for a nice summery <laughs> Christmas bloom. And that's, that is, um, literally, that's, that is the word that the natives used for this flower. That's the end of that part right there. Don't go anywhere, because now we're going to do some fun stuff down here in the front. All right, so while those are going around, I'm going to do a little bit more show and tell. Um, so I've been here at this residency this past week. It's been super cool, you guys. Um, I'm having a good time. And I have been, I've been thinking a little bit about that idea that I mentioned earlier about integrating sculptural things with uh, animating things. And, and I kind of interested in this idea of having a pop-up where you open it and you've got this nice big sculptural thing here. But then you would have additional openings beyond that initial opening that would somehow impact and animate the initial structure kind of in a puppety sort of way. That's what I'm thinking in my head. So I'm, um, I've got a couple of fairly rough things that are super good for showing you how raw process can be. Here, here's an initial stab. <coughs> I got to the point where it absolutely was not going to be viable for anything anymore. Um, and so I had a do-over. But you can see I kind of have some things marked out. Um, I've got a lot of cuts and things. I've got some tape sticking around in there. I've got lots of notes. So what, what this became, this one is best light, best light. Um, we have an opening here. So first it's just bird. We have dimensional bird head, bird body, bird wing, bird tail. <coughs> and then when we open over here at the side, we've got a pull that is turning the first bird's head and sort of looking down at the next bird that's coming up and it's popping up and it's also moving. 
And then Primary Bird is so excited about this that, boop! <laughs> and um, it got really wet last night, and this paper is super humid. So <laughs> they're, they're a tiny bit spongy right now. How are those pieces doing? We're good, okay. All right, so your rectangle piece has um, a score line that's been dash cut right down the center. Um, and incidentally, all the cutting that you are um, enjoying this evening is um, uh, a result of the machine that I use to cut and not my two hands. Um, I have to draw everything. Um, but I have a, a plotter cutter, so I just can feed paper in and little blade cuts everything out. I did not bring, I did not bring, it's not an unreasonable question, though immediately I thought, oh, here? No, but, oh, this old school. I'm working old school this week, yeah. Um, so there are two slots in this piece. You may or may not have material still in those two slots, and if you do, it might mean you need to take your fingernail, your neighbor's fingernail, and poke it in there and remove the material so those two slots are open. <laughs> then also, I would like for you to fold this on that center score line. Give it a nice pinch. That's the easy one. Okay, glasses. Grab this piece. Similar situation. It's got a center score line. It's got two slots. Make sure your slots are clear and then fold it down the middle. Just like you did with this previous one. That was the other easy one. <laughs> so this third one is not intimidating at all. It's totally going to be fine. It's totally going to be fine. If you look at this third piece, uh, oh, and this will be helpful. Let me show you what this is going to look like before we put it together. You get it? It's a book. You get it? You get it? All right. And you can see from the model as I've been walking down the middle here that some of them are mountain folds and some of them are valley folds. And you can know the difference between what is a mountain fold and what is a valley fold by the nature of the dash in the score line. The dashes that are a little longer and further apart are mountains. So like the one that goes through the middle of the figure's head is a mountain. The others are a little shorter and closer together, so the two lines that are here at the neck of the figure are valleys. So I want you to just kind of work your way around that figure and noting that that center line that runs through the middle is a mountain at the top and it's a valley in the middle and then goes back to be a, a mountain at the bottom. And just kind of pinch around the figure, just kind of gently hit all those folds, get them started, and then once you get them all started, you can collapse the figure down entirely, and then it's gonna fold to look like this. So if you haven't already, I haven't done it on the model, I'm gonna do it now, the two tabs at the ends of the arms, you can call them hands, let's call them hands, are gonna fold forward, because those are valleys too. We have two tabs that are kind of down here on either side, waist level, uh, which reminds me, do you all know what the circle said to the number eight? It's a golfing joke. Got it. Nice belt, nice belt. 
Um, there are kind of little triangle ends on these tabs on either side that need to get folded in. But they're not going to live their lives forever folded in like this. We're going to do this so we can fit them through a slot. And then they're going to open out and live their lives opened out. So we're not going to score them seriously. We're just going to give it a gentle initial fold. OK, so here's the next step. You've got the two little triangle tabs on the ends of these tabs at the waist. And those are going to fit into the slots in the folio. Front to back. The bottom of the figure is flush to the bottom of the folio. That's how you'll know you're putting it in the right way. Tabs are just going to hang out in the back, and that's great. Once you've got that threaded in, give yourself a slow, gentle close to make sure that it will do it and that the folio will close completely and everything is cozy and you're not introducing any new unwanted folds in there. We'll test it at every step to make sure we've got good fit and function before we continue. So if this wasn't a library, we would just stop here. But it is, so we need a book. <laughs> so now you're just going to do the same thing with those hand tabs and the two slots in the book piece. There's my first one threaded in. You know, we've got some time before we're actually evacuating this room, so if you want a moment for me to doctor your, your little guy there, I'm happy to do that. But I'll keep rolling here with stuff up front. Um, all right, and I'm going to show you the other model of what I've been working on this week. <coughs> so, loose concept. Um, it's another, it's another collection of creatures. You're going to be surprised to hear. Um, and, and I'm kind of bringing things sort of ultra local, like Chicago is the last book, um, the sixth extinction book. And this one literally is like the vacant yard that's next to my house. Um, so I've got this fence that runs around my house. So, um, so when they bring the bush hog over to, um, to mow in the big lot next door, the snakes will come up out of the grass and climb up into the fence to take refuge. So I also, um, you know, there's lots of sparrows in the neighborhood and the sparrows like to come up and eat the spiders and the earwigs that live in the fence. All right, so how do these things get mass produced? It's time to, it's time to hit that question. So not in the US, because US manufacturing is too expensive. So points of commercial production have migrated a lot, especially in the past 50 or so years. For a while, there was a production facility in Colombia, um, the country, and that no longer exists. Um, for a long time, China was central. Um, there's still some in China, but Chinese production has now also become expensive enough that it's migrated primarily into Southeast Asia. So uh, Southeast Asia. So production facility in Laos, um, it's where sixth extinction started, and then assembly was in Thailand. 
So I am, you know, I'm building these so that they can see color, so they can see structure. Um, I've already gone through a version that's been these, where, you know, it's just these rough white maquettes, just kind of like what I was walking around with. Let's pass this one around. That's also the, my initial slide. Um, let's pass this one around this way. And this is all, um, the color is, you know, the handmade paper stock also. Um, yeah. I'm going to hit that. I've got a couple steps before I can get there, though. But I'm going to answer that question for sure. <laughs> so, so they get these so they can see what the final version is going to look like. Um, the publisher gets these. Um, my guy, Greg, at Candlewick, who is the guy who goes there and communicates with their people because he does it for a living and he's good at it. And, you know, Candlewick does a lot of... Um, interactive books. So they've got this kind of thing going on all the time, multiple titles at a, at a time. So, so they're going to get that. But then also, I'm going to have each and every single piece that you see in this whole thing separate and mounted on mat board and um, you know, with bleed. So they can gang up those individual pieces onto a big 25, 35 is sheet, the parent sheet. So they print this size. And then there's a die for each of the different printed sheets. That's just a big cookie cutter. And those sheets go through the die, and all the pieces get punched out. Um, those two steps are all utterly mechanical, of course. Um, and then people weed out all of those pieces. And then it gets to the stage where we were with this where there's a table, and there's a very long line of um, uh, Thai, usually women. Um, and I think partly it's because they have smaller fingers, generally speaking, and that's an advantage. And um, they sit, and they just piecework, 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 piecework for months at a time. Um, change positions to kind of keep things fresh, but you know, it's hand assembly, it's hand assembly. So economies of scale are part of what makes these affordable. Um, Sixth Extinction uh, was released at a $75 rate, which is high, obviously, for a pop-up book. Neighborhood came out at $24.99. What, what are we selling these for tonight, Nancy? OK. That's what a market looks like. I said, that's what a market looks like. Price depends on where you are. <laughs> and, and Amazon immediately took this book that released for $75 and offered it $65. And within two months, they dropped it to $25. And then people wrote to me saying, I just bought that book for $75, and I see it's now available for $25. I am angry with you. And I said, Amazon Prime is the devil. Sorry, Amazon Prime. <laughs> Think really seriously about that. So um, it's astonishing that they can sell these books for as little as they do. Um, publishing is not an industry where people go to make money, as lots of us in this room know. Um, but it's a place we love, so that's the good part about it. Another question? Yeah. Yeah. That must be handmade. The dies are also handmade. It's one of the most expensive part of the process is taking a big board and taking a lot of metal, steel, and bending it, bending it, bending it. I tried um, for Marsh, the Marsh, Marsh book, the first book, um, which originally existed in paper cuts. So all of those shapes that you saw on the slide, the three snails and all of those grassy leaves behind them, it was all rendered in one sheet with paper cuts into a single sheet. And then it was mounted onto the super thin 
translucent sheet behind it. And uh, I made 10 copies of that book, uh, and I wanted to render it as paper cuts as well. So um, I decided I did not want to spend eight months of my life doing all of it by hand. So I called a die cutter, and I sent them one of these illustrations, and they said, not only can you not afford the die that we would make for you, you can't even afford the tools that we have to make so that we can make the die that you want. See you later. <laughs> so I said to myself, linoleum block printing is super fun. So that's what I did. That's what I did. Yeah. Yeah, the dies. The dies are really expensive. The dies are expensive. Yeah. Have you, um, have you sort of like conceived of something that you haven't been able to build yet? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you want to tell us about it? <laughs> yes. <clears throat> I mean, there's two, there's, there's two, there's two. Here's, here's number two, and then I'll circle back to number one. <coughs> um, Petey bug, as I think of him in, in my head, you know, it's based on a sow bug, pill bug, potato bug, whatever you call them, wherever you live regionally. And um, you all know, because you've seen them in the wild, that if you uncover one of these, they do like an armadillo, and they curl up and make this cute little adorable ball. And so when I originally did this for the artist book version, literally when you open the page, this flat thing rose up, folded, and curled, and became a ball. And it was the proudest thing <laughs> of my 40s. And uh, late 30s. And then I, I finished all of the models for that book. Um, and my goal for a two-week residency, two weeks, two weeks, residency was to take all the white models and render them in color. And I was working my way through the book, and I got to this one, and I pulled out the color. Um, and then I spent a week trying to recreate that action in the, the different stock, and I couldn't. And then I thought, OK, so I'll just recreate another one in the same cheapo uh, Office Depot white 110-pound index cheap stuff. I'll just recreate a second one of those just to sort of make sure it's streamlined. And I couldn't do it. So I have this thing um, at home that I can't recreate. <laughs> and, and I love it. It's perfect. It's what I want. And, and I had to abandon it. Um, and so this was, the, this was the thing that you know, operates very dependably, and it captures a lot of what needed to be captured. Um, and I super love these little tabs and hinges that kind of make the body segments uh, work that way. So you know, I let go, I let go. Um, but you know, for sure, I mean, engineering is, is really constrained because you're working with paper and um, everything has to collapse. Everything has to collapse. So if I were, if I were thinking you know, just sculpturally about building something like this, I could take layers of paper and build it up and flesh it out and you know, it's no big deal to think of it sculpturally, but adding that collapse part um, really sort of makes some interesting challenges. Um, also, for example, with my big mud mop here, um, I have, a, again, that situation where I have a segmented body where the pieces are tabbed together. And the vision always for this fish is that 
it's really puffed out like this. And the curse of the pop-up, one of the curses, is that it spends most of its life flat. And so those folds learn compression and they don't readily let that, uh, give that compression up so that when you open the fish then, it's like it's fine and you don't know what I was going for so it doesn't matter, your expectations aren't the same as mine. But in my head I think, oh, I know how that could be better. So, so every time, every time I do one of these, it's that process. I think this is what I'm gonna go for, this is, this is what's gonna be viable. So there's this little part of heartbreak that pushes me forward to the next project and makes, <laughs> keeps it happening. <coughs> That's the one of the two. <laughs> I'll come back. I have, um, I have a list, I have a list. Um, I've got a stack of about 50 sheets in a clipboard. Um, that's a list. Yeah, and right now, I mean right now, um, I'm kind of in a, a juicy spot because this came out last year. Um, my latest artist book came out last year, which is this holiday book. I'm going to bring this over for a little bit of shameless promotion, too. Uh, and then the holiday book also came out last year. So let's circulate that through the room while I'm talking. <clears throat> Two big things that came out last year. Also last year, I took over as the director of the Movable Book Society, um, which was not um, my choice, but it was good. It was good. It's good. Um, and, uh, and I ran a conference for the society last October. So I've been a little bit over a year right now since I finished this holiday book that's coming around. And of course this, even though it was released last October, I was done with it several years ago. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I've got a long list of ideas and right now I kind of just have to make a decision about what's, about what's next. But there's, there's all these dream ideas like this is what I'd like to do. Uh, can I actually make it work the way I envision it? Um, and there's a little bit of trade pressure. Can, do I want to continue to make artist books like the plant books that are really satisfying for me, but trade publishing is not really interested in them because they're not really viable commercially. Um, uh, so do I want to keep that part of the mix as I'm building? Um, uh, can I keep making collections of plants and animals and expect people to keep paying attention? Um, yeah. 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 So you said you're working on the arts with more animation and like the, the moving parts. Yeah. Um, does that make the visual elements fit into the narrative? I imagine you could trace back to the Japanese, right? I do. <laughs> I don't have a story in my head, so. If, I, if one shows up there, I will definitely entertain it. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's kind of what would like to happen. And you know, no question, I mean, this is, this is fiction. It doesn't have a narrative line to it, but it's fiction. So I can write fiction, but I haven't really done storytelling per se, yeah. Um, all right, so quick aside on this, and then I'm gonna come back to you. Your, your other question. Um, <clears throat> the Movable Book Society last year made this commemorative 25th anniversary collection of pop-up cards. Uh, it's got this sweet little sculptural element in the front by Bruce Foster, if any of you know Bruce Foster. Um, he's been making pop-ups in the trade industry for a long, 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 long time. And then they had a contest, basically, and they got 25, 26 pop-up engineers to each design their own letter of the alphabet. So 
to this box. So it's a box of alphabet cards. And um, here's A. Um, and the artist who made them is featured on the back in a little biography. So it's a, it's a sweet little project. And um, on sale now <laughs> through the Movable Book Society website, movablebooksociety.org. Um, $75. Uh, so you can take a quick look at that before you go to, if you want to. Let's go back to your question. Um, uh, since you talked about writing, I actually just want to ask two questions. Yeah. The first question I wanted to ask was, did you ever, did you ever think of like doing something on a much larger scale and maybe having it not be paper, but like email or something? Because that, that you do. Right. Second question, an unequivocal yes. Right, if someone asks, that'll be fun. Um, first question, um, which, is, which is more complicated. Um, it becomes a materials issue. Um, I, can, I can make this pop-up do all of the things that it's doing right here because it's made out of this paper at this weight and at this size. If it got bigger, then the materials would need to get thicker and there would need to be choices that would make sure that that material remained rigid and it would ultimately not become foldable, which means that it would need to have some other way to hinge, which might uh, introduce additional mass. So all of a sudden you're getting to a point where you've got something that closes and it won't close you know, more than this because everything inside of it bulks up too much. So you really start to lose the idea of what this is all about at this level. But it's, um, it's a little bit of a holy grail thing. It's something that comes up a lot. And Duncan Birmingham, who is the author of some of our best how-to books in the industry, this is one of them, if you're interested in exploring pop-ups, this would be my first choice. Um, the David Carter book that Scott and I were talking about. I should grab it while I'm up here. Let me have you, Scott. Um, it's also super good. It's also super, super good. Um, but um, there's more in this one, and this one goes a little bit more for... Um, Serious engineers. Pardon? Serious engineers, yeah. Um, but he did this, which is a giant pop-up man that's tucked behind um, a door in his house. <clears throat> so there's different expectations and it works. I assume it works, I assume it works. There was, um, in a second, um, Someone in New York suspended a pop-up that was built out of plywood, and so it hung, and it kind of had this angle, and then there was, there was a rope, and it opened up, and something popped up, popped out underneath it, and I saw pictures of that, and so it kind of answers that question too, but would only work singly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah.